I'm Iona and I'm assistant curator of metalwork here at the V&A and today I've brought a selection of objects from across the collections to celebrate Christmas, slightly wacky things, slightly eccentric. There's a Christmas tree in the background. We found a suckling pig that was just knocking about in our stores, which we named Noel. What's a Christmassy name? Noel. 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 We have a ginormous chicken on the table. We have a gold chocolate cup. We've got a massive pot to hold glog. We have properly gone to town, so it should be some fun. We're going to be doing more of this, so make sure to stay tuned and subscribe. But now it's time for Christmas. Christmas is a time for sending letters through the post and presents to loved ones and families. So what better way to encapsulate Christmas than the iconic pillar box? This really sweet tin dates from 1926 and actually doubled up as a little toy after all the biscuits were eaten because there's these slots to post your pocket money in. So after you've eaten all your biscuits, you could save up to buy even more biscuits because you haven't eaten enough at Christmas. Loads of biscuit manufacturers really caught on to how popular the selling of biscuits was at Christmas, so they'd always release eye-catching collectible designs and it was a really good marketing ploy. The post box is really detailed. There is the royal cipher for George V, who was on the throne at the time, and you've got different slots for penny post, half penny post, We've also got a slot for overseas letters and for letters in the country for all your friends living in rural areas. And also my favourite detail is this little notice to show that the post was collected five times a day. It was quite a service back in 1926. I don't actually know what type of biscuit went in this tin. Probably some sassy person in the comments will be like, oh my God, how would you not know? It's quite a narrow tin, but personally, if it was my tin, I would just stuff it full of the classic chocolate digestive. I know you all are obsessed with gloves. It doesn't really go with my outfit, but there is a reason why I'm wearing these. Sometimes we do wear gloves and sometimes we don't. Today we are handling ceramics and metalwork objects and they do require us to wear gloves, making sure that we're protecting all the delicate enamels on the ceramics and just making sure we're not leaving any fingerprints on the metalwork, which wouldn't really be a great look for us. <gasps> We've had our biscuits, so now it's time for some delicious hot chocolate. So I'm gonna move this tin and make way for this beautiful gilded chocolate cup from the 1690s. This is such a showstopper. I don't know about you, but I do love a hot chocolate around Christmas and I always get the marshmallows and whipped cream. You gotta go for it sometimes. Now, drinking hot chocolate in the late 1600s was a very different affair than today. There's no instant hot chocolate powder in sight. People actually thought chocolate had medicinal properties. I mean, I would 100% support that. It wasn't actually until the mid 1800s that chocolate bars really took shape. So people were consuming chocolate in its liquid form before that. Chocolate was a luxury commodity and it was very much bound up with the transatlantic slave trade, which is important to acknowledge. And the cacao tree was harvested by enslaved peoples only the very wealthy could afford hot chocolate, which is really shown in this highly gilded decorative chocolate cup. This chocolate cup is so elaborate. It's very fabulous. I mean, the inside of this, the gilding, imagine the chocolate just swishing about in that and being reflected in that gold. It's absolutely stunning. This is made out of silver gilt, which means it's a silver object with a very thin coating of gold to give it this beautiful, lustrous shine. So for those who fancy something a bit stronger than hot chocolate, we're going to move on to a giant glog pot. Every country has their favourite Christmas tipple, whether it's mulled wine or a bit of eggnog, but in Scandinavia, glog is the festive cocktail of choice. Now this absolutely massive glog pot would really keep the Christmas spirit going all night long. I mean, you could serve quite a few guests with this 
and we even have a matching little cup for you to drink your glog in as well as a ladle so you could spoon out the glog to your guests. Glog normally has a wine base there's a bit of cardamom, there's a bit of cinnamon, and then a bit of ginger in there. And there's also a few almonds and raisins thrown in if you're feeling particularly adventurous. This set was designed in the late 1970s by the Norwegian studio potter Leif Helga Enger. And it then went into factory production in the 1980s, but the decoration was done by hand. This glog pot is really impressive for its sheer size. I mean, it will definitely dominate the table. I mean, personally, it's not my favorite. I'm sorry to all the fans of Norwegian studio pottery of the late 1970s, but yeah, each their own. And also you'd have a great night drinking glog. So happy Christmas. So now on to the main event from one big whopper to another. All of these rather fabulous ceramics are what's called trompe l'oeil, which is just a fancy French way of saying trick of the eye. There'd be a real conversation starter at your Christmas dinner table. These type of ceramics date from the 1750s to 1760s, and there was a real craze for them. I'm gonna pick up this lovely asparagus dish but I'm gonna move it in two parts just because it's very, very fragile. This is made out of soft paste porcelain, which is very fine. So it's a bit nerve wracking picking it up. Trompe l'oeil was about poking fun and kind of challenging people's perspectives. So it might look like asparagus spears, but actually it would have served a sweet dish inside. So it's kind of playing games with your guests. These bright colours have been created by painting enamel and then firing the porcelain again. We have this big vegetable dish, which is a tureen, which is a little bit later than some of the others. This is actually from the 1850s. And my particular favourite are these figs. How sweet are they? They're actually for containing sugar. And just the level of detail and the colours is really spectacular. So. You know, I would like that on my Christmas list to those who know me who are watching this. And we also have this lovely cabbage gravy boat and it even comes on its own special platter with all the cabbage leaves as well. I'm not gonna pick this up because to be honest, it slightly scares me how fragile it is. But the real talking point on this table has to be this giant chicken. When we were putting together the object list for this video, we thought we absolutely need to have this chicken in our lives, and there she is. This would have been used to serve soup in, like many of the other terrines at the table, but because it was made of that really delicate soft paste porcelain, it would have had a liner inside it, because otherwise the porcelain would crack. But the attention to detail on this chicken is frankly astonishing. There are miniature chicks nestled under her wings and in her feathers. They are so sweet. And there's this top chick here who's got the best place, sitting on top of the chicken, just surveying the table. I would love this as a centerpiece. Forget about the soup. Why don't you just serve your turkey and a giant chicken just for the hell of it? So whether you serve your turkey in a giant chicken terrine or perhaps you fancy some suckling pig like Paul Noel over here, you need a plate to dish them up on and we have this really sweet plate designed by Eric Revillius, the 20th century painter and designer and it was produced by Wedgwood in 1938 and there's really lovely little details in this plate. I particularly like the fiery flambéed pudding in the middle with loads of flames coming out of it because for many the piece de resistance is the Christmas pudding. There's this festive holly around the edge and it also spells out Noel which is why we named our suckling pig Noel. There's also a matching gravy boat as well which has holly again and also my favourite detail is this little robin on the edge because I think that's a very quintessential image of Christmas, a robin with his little red feathers. Now, fun fact is the granddaughter of Eric Revillius is actually a curator at the V&A, and there's a video that she's made about him coming out soon, so, you know, another reason for you to subscribe. 
So we move on to this intriguing item, which is a cutlery set. And it dates from around 1690. And before the mid 18th century, people would actually travel with their own cutlery, which was a pretty good idea considering the questionable hygiene of certain establishments. So if you're visiting friends for dinner and you're unsure of their washing up abilities, maybe you yourself could get a portable cutlery set. I'm gonna lift up the lid and it will reveal there's six knives and a fork. This object is made out of ivory, so we wouldn't use ivory today because it's an unethical material, but back in the 1690s, many decorative objects were made of ivory. And if I lift out the knives, you can see they're very delicate little objects. There's six knives here, and in the centre, there's a fork. Back in the day, people would be used to actually eating with knives, so you would have one knife to pierce the food and another knife to cut it. It wouldn't actually be that unusual to have this many knives. This set has very whimsical decoration. There's a funny looking bird on the front and detailed flowers and tulips and leaves, all picked out in very festive shades of red and green. After your post-Christmas dinner nap, it's time for the savoury dessert course. Now, this truly takes the Christmas box set to a whole new level. This dates from around 1880 to 1890 and would make the perfect Christmas present. As you'll see inside is a fabulous set of instruments to help you in your refined life as a cheese and grape lover. Now, this set was retailed by the Manchester-based firm, Lewis Beaver, and inside we have a beautiful set of nutcrackers. These nutcrackers you would use to crack a whole nut and remove it from its shell, and it's got this very decorative swirl decoration on the handles, which is actually quite functional because it would allow a firm grip to crack the nuts. We also have my particular favourite, a pair of grape scissors. It would be very unrefined of you to simply pluck a grape from the bunch. Instead, you can use these scissors to gently snip the grape and remove it. It's also got this blunt edge so you wouldn't pierce the other grapes. I'm just gonna put that back in. And then the last two items in the set are these nut picks which you would use to spear the soft flesh of your cracked nut. So you have everything you need to enjoy the savoury dessert course. You've had your Christmas dinner, now it's time to get the party started. Everyone has their favourite Christmas tipple, whether it be a sherry or why not a cheeky Baileys, or instead, some lovely port. And we have this delightful port decanter here. This dates from the late 18th century. Think after dinner drinks in a Jane Austen novel and it's made of this lovely purple blue glass. If you want to be very classy, you wouldn't just have your bottle of port on the side, you would decant it into one of these spectacular glass vessels. Very handily we have in this gilded writing the word port, so you would actually remember what you were drinking, although I feel towards the end of the Christmas night you're absolutely sozzled, so you probably don't really care what you're drinking anyway. It's been really fun pulling all these objects together and exploring them, so I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. If I had to choose a favourite object, I mean, I do love the chicken, but I am a vegetarian, so I think I'm gonna have to go with the set of nutcrackers and grape scissors. Bring back the grape scissors. Let us know what your favorite object is, or perhaps you've got something even wackier at home that you can share with us in the comments. So, Merry Christmas, everyone, you filthy animals. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everyone. Sorry, I know I'm like flying around my hand. I feel like, the pressure got to me. You're really selling it to me, and it's like QVC. <laughs> I'm like, I need to buy this. <laughs> it's gonna be on the <laughs> One day only. 9.99. Oh, I need to remember. It's a really complex Norwegian name that I need to know. Leif Helga Enger. <laughs> <laughs>
Lace Helga Enger, Lace Helga Enger. Um, I feel like I'm going to really bring down the tone, the, the elite v &A. It's just me like, hello. <laughs> Shall I do that again? A whole net, what am I on about? Everyone needs a pair of grape scissors. Everyone needs a pair of grape scissors. That's so bizarre. That. Okay, I'll just say something. 